Is it coming through now? By any chance? Hello, hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, I think that should come through now. I can see it. Um, oh. Can it, is it coming through now, by any chance? Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> Can you hear me now? All right, right, <laughs> let's start again. Uh, okay, cool. So, all right, let's just fully restart this thing. Um, yeah, cool, see a bit back. <laughs> Round two, let's do it all again. I've just been talking to myself and no one could hear me. So we're gonna start again. This is the, this is the right way of doing it. Uh, live streams are a new and novel experience for myself. I'd love to get better at them. Um, and it's great. We've been working together with the ACM technical team, uh, Darren, whoop, whoop, uh, to get this together for you. Um, so nice, uh, thanks for joining. I My name's Tom, uh, I'm a game designer and have been working in games for the last 13 years. Uh, and I thought I would um, do a uh, presentation for you all about the 17 things every game designer should know when they get started. Because I uh, start didn't start my life as a game designer or anything in creative. I didn't go to university and do creative things or go to a college and do creative things. I did science. Thought I was gonna be a scientist, um, but deep within me, you know, as a passionate gamer, I was a semi-professional Counter-Strike player and I even played a little bit of Dota 2 professionally, even though I sucked at that, but uh, I was better at Counter-Strike. Um, and yeah, and then I found uh, my passion through uh, a cool presentation from another game designer or actually a marketing manager who worked in games and Gaming became an opportunity that I followed and I never looked back. Love games, still work in games, want to keep working in games. Um, games, games, games. <laughs> so, yeah, I appreciate um, where you are at um, and it's very difficult um, to know what it is you might want to be doing. Um, so hopefully these things might help you along your way. Um, so let's get into this presentation. Um, if you do learn from this um, and if you find that some of it is useful feel free to tell me my Twitter account is called Kinth K-I-N-N-T-H uh, you just hit me up and if you want to talk and any vibe off any ideas you have on game designs that makes me feel great so keep, keep going for it um, yeah so my name is Tom Kinnebra uh, I've been working in games for about 13 years I've worked with 150 mobile gaming studios and on about 180 games. So not all of those as a game designer, but as a producer, publisher, marketing director, product lead, or strategist. So I have done a little bit of everything. Uh, right now I mainly work in strategy, so working with bosses who run gaming studios and want to do, come up with new game strategies. Um, so less and less game design, but I have led teams, and run product teams as product lead, um, and worked on lots of different games, so all in mobile. So, the first learning of which there are 17, um, and I appreciate this has cut off some of the image, <laughs> but the first thing you have to learn is that your passion, your love, your desire, your, your baby is probably going to fail. One in 10 games really makes profit, and when a game is profitable, it drives 80 to 90 percent of a company's revenue so the very best games produce 10x what everything else does uh seven of the best seven of the ideas you'll have will probably lose money so if you feel and think through um your career you've got to learn how to deal with loss because it's going to happen more often than not and that's very difficult because every game idea you do have feels like it's the best idea you've ever had and staying positive is important like no no you know no 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 thing that fails was always a complete failure and there's always things that you can learn from it so i wanted to show you actually one of my personal failures 
Um, this was a game called Superbike uh, Street Bike Challenge. Um, Street Bike Full, full Blast. Uh, it was you know released in about two thousand and twelve, um, and it came in uh, to to us at Chilingo, uh, and it looked great. It had one of the best icons I'd seen. Um, we worked really hard on getting it to a state. Uh, the team had larger expectations, but really we missed a lot of key uh, inputs at the time. Uh, and it came out, it did some really good numbers for two or three days, and then it just dropped off. Nothing happened, uh, it never came back. And um, the team worked very hard on this. And so we learned essentially a lot about um, positioning. Uh, we positioned the game slightly wrong. Uh, the controls, we tried to use gyroscope when we should have used touch. Um, and proportions, the bike is really far too large for the rest of the uh, car, basically, you know, it's, it's bigger than a car. Um, I've just, that's always sat with me. This is the game that always sat with me as like, we really messed it up. Um, but it's still playable, you know, it's not a bad little game, it's just really didn't do what it was supposed to do. So, um, how do you spot failure and how do you fail fast? I've tried to include like small uh, shots, not of all games that I've worked on, but just basically other games. Um, and I, I always think um, one of the biggest factors is when you as a designer believe something, but when you play test it with your players, they get the exact opposite outcome. So that could even be as simple as, uh, what would you expect to happen when you push this button? The door is open and they might say, close the door. When you keep having a number of events that are like this, this is where you should start to worry because um, you have miscommunicated or confused the user so much that they're in the opposite. Um, this is a good way that you're, you've basically missed and that you should stop, retry or completely redo. The next thing is if people are play intensely, that's great, but too intensely uh, is wrong you essentially want people to calm down and get um, uh, into the game, out of the game, into the game again, and build it into a habit more than just an experience. So when we see people just constantly trying to beat something and then they, they tune out, they basically run out of steam. Um, and this is, you know, I've seen this uh, quite a few times. So uh, the final one is just simply a money factor. Making a great game, you have to have enough money to drive the installs. Um, and if marketing costs start cheap, which is great, they normally do, but they accelerate and they go or double within seven days, your game is not resonating with the audience clearly or your marketing is very, very bad. Um, and in both cases, they can both kill a game. So it's better to actually kill that game quicker before you get into those problem areas than it is to, to keep going. Um, the final point is about salvage. So out of every game that dies, it doesn't mean it's uh, not a, uh, it's a pure loss. You can still win and learn things um, along the way. And actually, most great games are made of all the salvaged parts of all the old games that have failed. And over time, you get better and better at salvaging things and being quicker at putting your ideas out into the world. Um, so for me, you know, level editing is a really, really big factor, making that easier to do and quicker. Um, when you're in a job or studio, talk to the developers about editors, level editors and tooling. Um, because as a designer, the quicker and easier that becomes for you, the more you can use it every time. Um, cool. Sorry. Um, third one is don't plan too much. I feel there are a lot of times where I thought I was going to do something um, and I ended up doing almost the opposite. So I thought I wanted to uh, buy a house and stay in the UK and I ended up uh, going to Germany and living there for five years. Uh, as you know, I um, was adaptable in the sense that I didn't plan and I took the experience and then on face value decided to come back to the UK after, after like loving being in Germany. Um, and yeah, I just believe like not everything in gaming or your job or life uh, is really a planable thing and you'll have a much better experience if you just do things. So 
I now do sort of try and set up my overarching goals, which is where I want to be and what I want to achieve. Uh, and I just try and keep that on a Google note with a three month, one year and five year goals and cross them off when I do. So just keep that focus on adaptability and curiosity because it will always serve you well. Four, um, when you're thinking of a new game, you'll often find that an idea you have for a game keeps coming around in different forms. You might be very keen on um, auto battlers was one that I sort of really worked around, uh, which is the idea of having an army of units and they fight always the same way themselves. You don't control them. And it's a strategic game, a bit like chess or auto chess, it was sometimes called, where where you set them up in a position, um, you would you would would affect how they fight, but you would have no control when they were fighting. Um, and so what we found is that that concept was a great mechanic, but it wasn't translating well into any games. So it was a very difficult concept to have in in life, you know chess that fights right um it, it didn't make a lot of sense to people so i was working with a studio and we were sort of really really focused around that mechanic but in the end we had to adapt it to be a much more of a merging mechanic where players would have an interaction of merging on a chessboard and that just worked so much better because people could feel like they were playing chess but it was a sort of battle chess um so sticky ideas work because you're thinking through all the outcomes of uh, what could happen and over time you're rigorously testing the idea in your head and that's why stickier things often lead to better outcomes when you very very quickly fa fast follow it's called which is like oh this game's come out it's doing really well let's just make a game like it because you haven't thought through many of the outcomes you often miss you get sort of the wrong feeling or you do something like that um, and yeah, just um, when you have these ideas, write them down, keep notes and build them out. So there's like a ton of notes and design docs I've got. I once did 37 design docs in two days. I remember doing this when we were trying to come up with a new game and it was hell. That was a lot of work and it was just concept and they're all one, one pages. But of those, some of my ideas, I think I um, I still keep and I still resonate with me. And one of the best ideas I ever had was in a game jam, uh, was a uh, Nyan Cat plus uh, Jenga um, in a kind of Japanese d d sushi hole. It was called, we called it Sushi Cats, and you had to stack cats of sushi, and they would purr, and you would have purritos. It was sick. Um, but basically, we never, it never saw the light of day. But I, I'll bring that back sometime. So the best ideas keep coming back. Never assume. A really big thing in game design is that you um, really believe someone thinks something or they play like yourself. Um, there's a really good technique called assumption testing, um, which is where you and the team sit down and you write I statements. I think people will do this. I believe we will do that. I will show this uh, this fact and writing all those assumptions down sees how the rest of the team feels and then you could do who would do this why would they do that when do they do this and you write W statements if you get a lot of commonalities between them then you've got to make sure that your game design has answered those commonalities if it doesn't then you go back and fix it you try and get rid of all the assumptions you try and teach the players before they assume uh, does everyone know what a sword does? No, they don't know what a sword does. How does a sword do it? It's got the simple act acronym AOAAT for Assumption, Objective, Audience, t Twist, Test. But you can run through that in your head um, and trying to think through uh, ways of um, setting up your game design. Um, this goes further. So I really like a company called Nuco Brain. They're actually an advertising firm, um, but they are obsessed with strategy. Um, the point is that when you get into advertising, you're trying to synthesize an idea into its simplest form uh, that you can communicate in five to 10 seconds. And it has to be clear, believable, memorable, um, and that's quite difficult. So advertising strategy, if you apply it to games, 
um, can be really effective because you often have a game that needs to be understandable in 10 seconds, pick up and play in 10 seconds, f enjoyable in 10 seconds. And so that takes a lot of thinking about how to how to make objectives clear, how to strategize it. So I use this sort of format um, to break down where we are up to with our objectives. Um, and really that's where it all starts, having good clear objectives of what the game is trying to do and who it's doing it for. Um, will lead you in a good way. You can expand this so far that it fits to company-wide uh, focus and having strategies on everything um, actually really cements the thinking within a company. So I often sit with sort of studio bosses now and talk to them, what's your business strategy? What's your hiring strategy? What's your comms and media strategy? And the vast majority won't have strategies for most things. They'll have an overarching strategy. So actually breaking each strategic department down, um, giving the work out to the people who are doing it and getting people to feedback on a simple uh, form about their objectives can actually show you where big problems are happening in organizations. Um, and sort of as you get more and more into games and bigger, bigger studios, most of the problems exist not with the idea of the game, but with the teams and how they're implementing different things at different times. Um, what, Coming up with strategies and how to think through strategies takes a lot of time, uh, but it's a skill that you kind of work through and, and learn yourself. Um, making games is great. The love of games is great, but making money matters more. Um, if you can't build a project or product that makes more money than it costs you to create, it's gonna die. Um, the sooner you sort of realize that you should be thinking with a money hat on uh, more often than not, the more you'll start to, I'm just thinking there. <laughs> Jerry Maguire is a great film, probably never seen it, go watch it. It's like um, probably the, one of the only films with um, uh, whatever that guy's name is, the way he's good, but yeah, it's about a guy who manages a football team. Um, and yeah, you, you focus on this money and the key metric we always use, and it's the best metric, is called lifetime value. So rather than focusing just purely on one stream of revenue, like how much someone pays, can you get more money from what they do in your app? Advertising, um, recommendations, social inputs, these all have a value that you can monetize. Um, and so using that and working it out, using a spreadsheet is, is basically one of the best techniques to get it, to getting um, a product, an idea into a product. And a product is always a sort of game design that makes money. That's how I always like to think of it. Um, uh, out of that, we I sort of come up with an idea of like the Triforce. So the game design Triforce. Even in product, you really have three clear uh, types of person. Um, it's very difficult to find anyone who's good at all three, to be both a great game designer, producer, or product manager. More likely, you have a strong force in one, and you have a secondary force. Um, so you could be a great game designer and have good production skills. You could be a great game designer and be very good at product management skills. Each of those core types is in charge of different things. So a game designer is in charge with the look feel of the internals of the game. The producer is in charge of managing the team budget scale and timeline. And the product manager is in charge of managing the game that's out. How are the people responding? What's, uh, how are we monetizing them? What advertising are we doing? And in each case, they have auxiliary partners who help both of them. So marketing, business, QA, and user testing. Finally, at the center of that is a product lead who normally has to manage or is one of these people, but is, is finally in charge with the vision. The vision is the overarching internal of the game design, external of the market, team, team focus, team health, team um, um, appetite, uh, all comes down to what the product lead sets and they set the uh, overarching goals. So actually just one question. Uh, it's good to start to think where you wanna be because you can't do everything. So start to specialize as much as possible in one of these areas so that you can actually learn more 
it's always better to be um, a, f a master of one thing than a jack of all trades and just keep focusing at becoming a master first. If you've mastered something, then you can go back and start again and master something else, but don't do everything at the same time. Um, yeah, we had a few um, of the guys do the deconstruction workshop uh, two days ago. Um, and this is basically what we uh, have done for many years uh, and how, how I got a lot better at making games. Um, deconstructing is really the uh, rigorous testing of a product yourself in a similar form uh, while writing down how it works and what it does well. Uh, figuring out um, by looking at it um, where it's breaking down um, and there's sort of four different hats that we'll go through about where you can think about these things. Um, every game um, has good points and bad points. There is no bad game. Um, and using this to deconstruct things makes you understand how to build something back better. And that's why we always deconstruct down so that when we design, we can build back better. And the key really with good game design is thinking backwards. Um, when you really consider what you want to drive and why someone's driving it, the value, um, that actually starts at the end, like what will people value? Um, a good uh, example is in like a football team, people value the players. In uh, Hearthstone, which is a card game, people value the cards. In um, Dota 2, is there any value? You get everything uh, for free in Dota 2. There's nothing um, to pay for. But what people value is the skill and like the understanding of how to play a hero. Um, so being able to be taught and trained is a different type of value. So when you um, try and break things backwards, always start with that value. And then try and think why people will come back for that value. What's the thing that's driving them forward? How, so Hearthstone, how often are we going to get new cards? What, are the, what do people do with the cards once they've got all the cards? How do we reutilize all of our cards? These sorts of things. And uh, this is coming from sort of the game design uh, workshop, but you can think of everything with these different hats. Hats help you consolidate um, your thought processes to keep them focused on the problem at hand. And monetization, progression, uh, metagame are all different types of problems and they have different solutions. The magic hat is always uh, the thing that you do last because even though you have uh, the players experience magic moments, that's sort of how people feel, um, crazy transitions, cool cutscenes, animations, um, that's what someone will experience. But as a designer, you think backwards. So think about the money first, think about retaining them second, thinking about them progress third, and then you can add the magic at the end. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the flow in which the team will work, but as a designer, that's how you have to think in your mental model. Um, another great technique that I have seen and used um, multiple times is the idea of shaping up. Uh, shaping up uh, is a book. Um, and it's a product related book uh, i can't remember who wrote it about taking ideas and l shaping them a shaped idea is essentially an idea with a boundary and a boundary with a goal so um, you don't dictate a solution you really give people the context of why we're doing this problem why this problem is important and then you allow the team on everyone else to, to break that out into, into small scoped out solutions. As you, as you scope out and cr create those solutions, you bring them all together to try and um, solve the problem. Uh, and that results in a much better way of built product because everybody's involved, it's broken down into pieces and it's done not solution first, but problem first. Um, 10. I thought I'd put a bit of a tune on. Um, I really like music. I've always liked music. I'm quite into drum and bass. I've been in drum and bass for like 15 years, 20 years, been a DJ. And um, when I actually work, I take my uh, headphones and I sit there and when I'm getting into the zone, I just put my headphones on and blast some tunes. And in order to do that, I allow it, it allows me to focus. Uh, and focusing 
is where I find I get my most creative passions. So I'm, now I'm just listening to June. Just, just for June, basically. <laughs> um, remember, you can do that. Remember to take yourself out, focus, feel an energy, and then do the problem. That vibe, that setting that vibe, can come out in your work. And you need to give yourself that space to do that. So, you know, remember the tunes. They drive a lot of things. Okay. Uh, 11. Um, I learned this the hard way. Um, this was like, I only learned this maybe four or five years ago. Uh, we had a game where it had um, characters, cards, moves, and actions and people kept confusing actions moves and cards and we would be talking about things as a team and people would completely get the wrong end of the stick and would be working on the wrong problem a good example i've seen here is the naming of swords there are many types of swords they all do the same thing they all cut people but there's so many different types of swords and they all got named unless you actually write them down and unless you actually build a dictionary you get things wrong and it's your job as design to make sure the team talks the same language if people make a mistake you call them up on it if they say oh i just took this action from that point you're like that's not an action that was a card you have to be really strong here and stick to it and if people don't understand you say point point them in the direction of your dictionary and as a new thing comes on add it to the dictionary you have to keep it updated and, and as everyone starts to talk the name of the action um, it will solve many problems later up down the line when things get more complicated you don't want people confused number 12 um, it's a team sport uh, so where I first wanted to make a game and I thought as a, I am the game designer it's, it's my game it's you know that's what I, my job is right my job is to design these things nothing in any sort of game design is one person everyone learns from each other and everyone has great ideas that kind of come together in fact most game design is actually accepting you don't get what you want but you get the best of what everyone else can do and fitting around those difficult things is actually good game design so when we made a system that was kind of like a damage system it's um you know you could be using it for weapon based damage but as a designer you now have a damage system how can you extend that to do fire ice acid there are simple techniques to add in from one damage a damage type maybe a damage type with time maybe a damage type with um other additional uh, abilities and this is a kind of modular approach to damage but you wouldn't have designed that at the beginning. You basically were told that by a developer who was like, I can build it in this way. And then an artist was like, well, the way this works uh, when I add in my uh, colors is I can only get one color to show or something. And so then as a designer, you need to adapt your designs and think about uh, the final outcome. Because at the end of the day, your job is the outcome, but how you get to that outcome is basically the team. Uh, so work well as a team. And remember, if you're a designer, you're more of a goalie and a winger than you are the attacker or the defense. You're helping the f with the flourishes and the play, but you won't be the person to get the final execution and you won't be the person to do the grunt work, to keep the, keep the line strong. That's developers. Um, also, make developers your best friend because if you have a great developer, you make a great game. If you have a bad developer, you make a bad game. Um, 13, yeah, so testing is really, really, really important. Um, you don't realize how bad things are till people show you. And the only way people can truly show you is by playing your game. So uh, we use a company called Playtest Cloud um, and they essentially help you record gameplay testing. Uh, and then uh, you can set everyone a sort of short video uh, that, that um, then uh, shows them how they play the game. Um, we use this a number of times. Um, we would do two to four tests a week 
on whatever product we had and we would take notes and we would interview people and we would learn and feedback to the team. And this became one of the best techniques I've ever seen in actually improving games for, from a week to week basis. So just two to four tests was all we needed, um, but they would prove to us whether things that we'd done in the week had actually had a difference. Um, cool. The 14th one is flow states. This is just a great way of thinking about um, the outcome from a player. Um, you always want to balance skill and difficulty, but you don't want them to be the same all the time. You want a curve. So when you've got a game and if it's all, and it already feels like it's a very difficult thing, ease it off and add something that's more skillful, but they can't get wrong. If you've got something that people have to be very skillful or strategic, try to, try to make something more difficult. So you bring them back towards, um, essentially something where they can master but they still could be they still don't know the outcome from from the future basically uh random events are really good at basically building anxiety um yeah consider when you're playing other games what flow they're in and if you're in the same category you most likely want a similar flow um i use this quite a lot just to kind of assess how i feel about when i'm playing a game um, I showed this also, um, but I just believe um, games should all be about movement. Um, the power that we have as designers of computer games is that everything uh, people interact with and they interact with it in a visual way. We can cheat um, the reality. Physics doesn't need to apply inside of a computer game. You have your own physics. You can bend physics, essentially. And so Disney um, animated things uh, the most effective. Uh, he came up with 12 rules to help people understand concepts and use these 12 rules to um, better teach what is going on with a visual medium. Combining this with gameplay is essentially juice and juicing things just makes things more fun to use and interact with. Um, you often want to juice the things that people do the most or have the juiciest things close to what you do the most. Let's say if a character is in a running game like Temple Run, in the character's field of view, you want the juice to be around that, but you wouldn't want to juice the buttons or something that's out of that. Never, one other really f important factor is never slow the game down in order to juice it. Always keep the game the same. So if it was boring and flat, but fast, that's still more fun than medium and juicy. Juicy just needs to be the added extra, but should never slow you down. Anything that slows things down makes makes things not fun. Interaction should feel fast, cool, and um, have uh, communication that helps you understand what's going on. Cool. Um, the next thing I really like is thinking about curves so one thing you do have in design is when you have an animation or when you have an action um, you can often think about curves so take a look at this hearthstone it's a specific uh, deck with this thing called solid either side this animation is naturally on a curve it swings it's timings it's um, attack is very very natural it has a kind of weight to it that is it feels like a side swimming swinging and it is not any transition in that is not straight everything had a bit of a growth everything had a delay everything had a drop at a different rate um, and that's often what i mean about curve you can add curves to weapon damage so damage shouldn't go up linearly it goes up with a kick at the end you could add a curve to something like a button tap where it's Fast, 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 slow, 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 slow. Uh, you could add a wiggle, right, to sort of a randomized event, sort of um, how a, bo a box opens fast or slow or somewhere in between. It can be a random, uh, but from a curve. Um, or you can essentially uh, you know, think about financial grinding to earn currency to buy something. Never just have it, it was 100, now it's 200, now it's 300, now it's 400. 
100, 200, 400, 800, mm, let's just go with 1200 now. Keep the curve varying slightly, but, and the differences between the two should have some natural effects. Everything there, I think curving curves make things have feel like weight, and there is always a natural weight to what people interpret in software. It's easy to get software to click and do things, but it doesn't feel like it's natural. Great software has weight, um, so start to learn what the weight of things should feel like. Hearthstone is a, per is a very good game at this. It has incredibly good curve usage and the, the speed of things, um, like actions, kind of naturally take the time they should take and the, the dropping things has a physicality to them. Uh, and the final one, 17, is easy in and easy out. Um, when we were talking about this in the game design workshop, um, I kind of went into a lot of detail here because we call this session design in mobile. And a mobile game is very important to have session design because most people play a mobile game 20 times a day for one to two minutes a time. But people play console games for maybe one or two times a day for two to four hours at a time. So in a mobile game, how those sessions are structured and the, the time between those sessions has an effect on the gameplay. Uh, that's things like timers, that's things like unlocks, that's um, things like uh, new levels being available for people. How you design though that session is a game design challenge uh, as well. So understanding um, what people's priorities are and also understanding that most people always want to be doing something else, even when they're doing the thing they're doing. Um, you can kind of think of everything in chunks. A chunk is sort of a core loop. A chunk is a metagame space. A chunk is a piece of time in between not playing a game. What do you want to happen in your chunks and put your chunks out in an order you think that people will like? And then watch. Watch people play. Watch if they do do what you do. Watch if it's natural, basically. So easing someone in is making the process of opening a game really pleasurable so that when you get back, it feels great. Easing someone out is once you've played the game for a set period of time, five to 10 minutes, things become harder, you've run out of stuff, the game naturally says, there's not much more to do here. You've completed your goals, come back tomorrow, you've uh, opened all your rewards, there'll be more when you, when you win the game again. This is a way to show people that by continually playing, there's no point, there's nothing to gain. Have a break, come back tomorrow. And that's much stronger for the game as a whole because you're teaching people to be habitual around something. Habits create great games because they have long lasting retention. And if you truly understand retention, retention is built from session design and retention is at the heart of any success. You don't get strong gameplay unless people keep coming back again and again and again to play it. So, yeah, here's you. You're starting out. Um, making games truly is the best job in the world. I love what I do. Um, I love helping other people. Um, and I love working on, with other people. You know, I've not had the pleasure of making um, a truly fantastic game myself. But I have had the pleasure of working with teams that have come up with and, and honed in top performing games all around the world and have been a real part of making those games as good as they could be. So I want to keep doing that um, and I want to make sure other people are inspired to do it because you can do um, and just just get out there and play more games. Cool. I did have a question slide but considering this is a live feed with no chat that's going to be really difficult. So I will leave it there. Um, thank you so much for listening as long as you did listen. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with ACM. Uh, I think they've had some really cool students and I'm really uh, glad to see what they're doing. Um, so here's the future. Uh, and yeah, feel free to reach out if you ever want anything. Thanks a lot.